Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com, and we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Airbrake. Airbrake is full stack, real-time error monitoring. Get real-time error alerts plus all the info you need to fix any error fast. And in this segment, I'm talking to Joe Godfrey, CEO of Airbrake, about why getting to the root cause of errors is so important. Look, Adam, to me, root cause is everything. All software has bugs. We all know that. And when you find a bug or, or when you can't find a bug... The amount of time that typically gets spent trying to chase around and figure out how to reproduce the problem and what's the cause of the problem, even like what part of the code kicked it off or what sort of actions drive it. I mean, that's hours and hours of time wasted spent chasing your tail instead of actually fixing the problem, improving the customer experience and getting back to building more features, which is really what your company is all about. So to me, being able to really understand like what is the root cause of this problem is the key factor to being able to solve that problem and get back to doing what's most important, which is building new features and improving your product and, and quite frankly, fixing the customer experience that's broken as long as that bug is out there. All right, check out Airbrake at airbrake.io slash changelog. Our listeners can try out Airbrake for free for 30 days. Plus, you get 50% off your first three months. Try it free today. Once again, airbrake.io slash changelog. Listening to the Change Log, a podcast featuring the hackers, leaders, and innovators of open source. I'm Adam Stakoviak, editor in chief of Change Log. On today's show, Jared and I are talking to Julia Grace about scaling all the things at Slack. Julia is currently the senior director of infrastructure engineering at Slack and has been there since 2015. So she's seen Slack during its hyper growth. We talked about Slack's growth and scale challenges, scaling engineering teams, the responsibilities and challenges of being a manager, communicating up and communicating down, quality of service and reliability, and what it takes to build high-performing leadership teams. So we're here on the leadership front lines. I love that line in your in your summary for your session at Velocity, Julia. Thank you. We're here on the leadership front lines. And I think, you know, one thing we talk about a lot in engineering software development is scaling, right? But you often think about scaling software, not so much scaling teams. And, you know, from my point of view, and I'm sure Jerry will agree, is like Slack has been in this constant scale motion like you've never been able to just kind of like chill out in some sort of infrastructure setup like you've always been scaling and so true this conversation is essentially about scaling all the things what do you think you know so when i interviewed at slack two and a half years ago in a few months it'll be three years i was told by cal henderson our cto he said you know we don't have anyone for you to manage but we're gonna hire some people and we'll figure it out and by the time the time that had elapsed between when I interviewed and when I started, I think we had hired five more people. And so my first day, I was managing a team of about seven engineers, I think, at that time. Um, seven incredible front-end engineers because we needed someone to manage front-end engineers. I, I would never characterize myself as a, a um, front-end engineer. I'm much more of a back-end engineer, which means I have huge respect for folks who do front-end work. So I, I come on board. Um, I'm really forced into a fascinating situation where I was not the subject matter expert, as I had said earlier. You know, I, I'm definitely a back-end person, and so I really had to focus on becoming a great manager because when I would, for example look at pull requests. I didn't know if some of the code that was being written, you know, if if those were the right architectural decisions. So I really had to defer to the team and I really had to um, get really good at asking a lot of questions. I actually did read a lot of code. Um, I I, I learned a lot about JavaScript um, in that initial period. And then if you fast forward, you know, from the the seven front end engineers two and a half years ago, I now run an organization that didn't even exist 18 months ago, infrastructure, that has 75 people. And so, you know, that's 10x growth in two and a half years. And 
over the time, every six months, my job would totally change from managing front end engineers to managing both front end and back end to managing a junior manager to leading in the infrastructure organization, which was small at the time, which then grew from you know, 12 to 50 to now 75. And so it's, I look back two and a half years ago and I, I, I barely recognize the job I used to have because we've grown so much. So we have a very small team here, Julia, and I've always been on small teams. I've never even been on a team of 70, let alone managed one. So I hear that number and I, I am just immediately overwhelmed. I start sweating. You know, my hands are getting a little <laughs> sweaty. Just thinking about the responsibility. And when you first started, I mean, two and a half years ago, three years ago, wasn't very long and you had a team of seven. Do you do you sleep well at night? Do you have, do you feel like you have the weight of the world on your shoulder? That's just a lot of people to... Yeah, I agree with that. Just a lot of people. So I have learned a lot over that time. I feel as a leader... The, the only way that I can be successful is by having an incredible and having the privilege of having an incredible, incredible team. And so with that comes hiring amazing people so that I can sleep well at night. And so it's not, you know, when you think about the number 75, if you think about 75 humans, like that's that's a lot of folks, but we have, the organization is divided in different ways and I have incredible leaders um, that again, I have the privilege of working with who lead some of those sub organizations. And I really, you know, part of growing fast is learning how to delegate and give things away really rapidly. So there were so many things I worked on early, in the early days. An example would be hiring processes and how we hire, especially at the time, front-end engineers, because that was my jam. And now I've, I've given that away to somebody who did additional iterations, made it even better. And then they you know, grew and scaled in their role, and they gave it away um, to someone else. And I say that in a, in a, in a wonderful way where we're always iterating and un, and growing and changing and evolving on everything that we do. And I've had to, the really big challenge that I found is you have to learn how to do that for yourself um, because growing, if you want to, in a hyper growth company, you have to grow and evolve with the company. And that is one of the hardest things and having the mindset of like every day I go to work and I do things I don't know how to do that I've never done before. And then I get reasonably good at them and then I hand them off to someone else who they've never done it before, but they can pick up where I left off and make it even better. And so there's a lot of, so the hiring process is one example of that sort of thing. Also, how do we communicate as a 75 person organization? How do we propagate knowledge? How do we propagate decisions? And that means both top down, like from myself and my boss, but also bottoms up from the um, engineering front lines, the critical decisions that we're making, propagating that up to myself and then my boss. It's interesting to, to hear how, you know, in hyper growth companies, you to take on the role and or roles over time, you really have to accept that maybe what you would learn in the book, uh, who moved my cheese? The, the idea of change, right? Like you cannot be a, a fearful person of change because it's inevitable. I think it's probably the case in most lives anyways, but even more so in a hyper growth company where you've got to accept change. And if you're the kind of person that can't deal with change that rapidly, maybe it's not for you. Absolutely. I mean, I, I do think that just like every company isn't for everyone, you know, there's there's folks who are attracted to that high velocity of change. And then there are also individuals for very legitimate and understandable reasons where it may not be the right environment. Um, one of the things I, I, I always say um, with my team, especially you know, given we just moved to a new office building, I was running around trying to find all the conference rooms in the various floors. The, the thing we say now is the only thing constant at Slack is change. And so 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean volatility. Um, it doesn't mean things are hectic and scary. Instead, it means that we're always trying to learn and iterate and grow and learn how to do things better. And I, myself as a leader, am always trying to figure out what are the things that I'm dropping on the floor, what are the areas where I need to improve, and a big part of being able to do that is creating a safe and inclusive culture so that people can provide you with feedback. Because the only way that you'll be able to learn and grow really, really rapidly is with really, really excellent high bandwidth feedback from the people below you, the, your peers, in my case, and from upper management. I think that's so true, that point about you know the only constant is change at Slack as a software company. And, and I think it can be applied to anybody who's writing software or running businesses on software, that's the only thing that we know is going to happen is that things are going to change and that we don't know as much right now as we're going to know later, right? And so we build our systems and we design things in order that they can change, right? Malleable as opposed to rigid. And we do as little as we can now because we're going to be smarter later and we can make wiser uh, decisions later. So you're in a, a senior role now, right? I, I am. I mean, it kind of, it depends on how you define senior. Um, do you have your new title? I, I do have it in my title. <laughs> thus, it must be. You, thus, it, it must, must be, be true. true. <laughs> the point I'm getting at is like, so if you're a senior now, you were, were you always senior? Is this new for you? And maybe share some points along your path of like, you know, scaling you from someone who wasn't senior, the things you've learned and the things you've had to endure to get to a senior role and, and some of the responsibilities you hold day to day. Absolutely. So um, I have definitely not always been in in a senior role. And let me tell you, it has been a um, long and fantastic journey to get here um, that was never always up and to the right. You know, my career has taken many different twists and turns, and I've tried out product management, and I tried founding a company, and so I've done all kinds of things and learned so many things along the way. Um, so at Slack, it, it, it's funny, when I joined, I was a senior engineering manager, so maybe it comes full circle. Um, and then I, was, I, I transitioned into an engineering director when I started running infrastructure, and I'm now a senior director, so, um, I got that senior back, um, and you know, in the beginning, when I was managing that team of seven front-end engineers, I was, and again, not hands-on from a. I was writing code because, as we've talked about, you know, I wasn't the right person to be making the technical decisions. Although, you know, I can understand the technology quite well and quite quickly. Um, but I knew what the team was working on. I knew the challenges. I knew um, with a very high degree what, the, what was coming next for them. Um, engineering was much smaller then um, at Slack. It was f less than 100 people. So the group that I was in had about 25 engineers. So I, I knew what our larger plan was for all those 25 engineers. Um, I would often sit in meetings that were talking about and again, as a manager, I do attend a lot of meetings. Um, the goal of often attending a lot of those meetings is to gather information and to also see when people are blocked and how I can help them um, and how I can also help transmit information throughout the organization. So I would sit in, in meetings that would be talking about things at the feature level. Um, and as I transitioned, my transition to, a, to lead infrastructure, one of the things that happened was um, this was a brand new engineering organization. So, um, and, you know, when when engineering teams get big enough, you have to subdivide them in in some sort of logical way, but always knowing that that org structures and how you divide that that's a very hard problem. And so, we had had a, a logical division there of how how we would divide it. And now I was running this new organization. And so I had this really exciting, unique opportunity to figure out, well, what is the mission and what is the vision and what is the strategy for infrastructure? So um, instead of thinking necessarily about the feature level that I had before um, and the vision and the larger plan being set by the senior directors and VPs in that previous engineering organization, I was thus in those shoes. So I had to figure out 
What are the current challenges with our infrastructure? How are we scaling right now? What, what's breaking? And how are we going to scale for the, through the next huge jump and growth in our user base? Um, what are the things that are important for us to work on but not urgent? What are the fires that are burning? So I really had to deeply understand from this infrastructure perspective um, what was going on. And I had to create a compelling vision that resonated not only with the engineers, but with the senior executives, the CTO, the VP of engineering, even the CEO, Stuart Butterfield. I presented this vision to him as well. So it moved from feature level again to all of infrastructure. And now as a senior director, as my boss likes to tell me, um, my boss is Michael Lopp, who um, many of you may know him on the internet as Rands. My role is not only to stay involved in infrastructure, I mean, I'm, I'm so, I love this team. I feel like it is such an incredible, incredible organization. But to think about all of engineering and the company as well. So um, engineering is now, when I joined two and a half years ago, was around 100 people. And now I think we're at around 350 people. So um, thinking at that larger scale, thinking about how we make decisions that impact um, across all of the organizations and impact other places of the company. So it's all about leveling up the scale at which you're thinking about. And when you do that, you can then have even greater impact. But the challenge, the, the, one of the hardest challenges with that is that now you need to influence. And again, it, you know, I, I deeply think one of the, mo the most profound lessons that I learned in my career was when I became a product manager and I had to learn how to influence people, um, the people being the engineers, when I was not their manager and I did not have explicit authority to tell them what to do. And so what, the higher up that you go in management, your job is all about influence. Ultimately, the engineers in my organization and other organizations, they decide what code they're going to write that day and what code they're not going to write that day. They make all of the decisions. Now, I try to influence those decisions by giving them additional context, by giving them background, um, by talking about why what they're working on is so important. But at the end of the day, like they decide their destiny, and I am there to help support and guide them. And the higher you go up in an organization, you have to be able to influence even more people in the organization, and that's incredibly, incredibly difficult to do. That last part about the dream part is, is something that resonates with me. I've played the role of product manager for a bit. And that's such a truth where to, to be able to influence somebody, you have to share with them a dream to strive for. And and when you don't have that explicit control over their day-to-day -day code they can write or even manage them to guide them that way, every step of the way, you have to be able to kind of cast some sort of vision or dream for them to follow. Because otherwise, it's they're just going to do what they have to do to ship code and keep it simple. Absolutely. You have to inspire and compel folks to be aligned with where you think the organization should go, um, with the exciting challenges. You, you need to be able to craft a message that really resonates with the team. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is a cloud computing platform built with simplicity at the forefront. So managing infrastructure is easy, whether you're a business running one single virtual machine or 10,000. DigitalOcean gets out of your way so teams can build, deploy, and scale cloud apps faster and more efficiently. Join the ranks of Docker, GitLab, Slack, HashiCorp, WeWork, Fastly, and more. Enjoy simple, predictable pricing. Sign up, deploy your app in seconds. Head to do.co slash changelog, and our listeners get a free $100 credit to spend in your first 60 days. Try it free. Once again, head to do.co slash changelog.
So Julia, as I listen to you talk and I'm trying to think about, you know, trying to have takeaways of like what makes a great leader. And I'm always thinking in the context of a developer and like what makes a great developer slash leader or what turns a great developer into a great leader. And I'm thinking about your, your points about a, a communication. I think that's an obvious one and definitely like the most paramount thing. If I think about the, the best developers I've met, we've interviewed a lot of them on the show. Like what makes them stand out? A, their ability to communicate. Absolutely. Communicate their thoughts, right? Um, so let's set that one aside and say, aside from a communication, the next thing that I think of with great developers is their ability to kind of inhabit an entire system or to keep, like the more of a system you can keep in your head, the whole thing, right? Holistically, the better you are as a developer, I believe, and I've found. And so what you were talking about was really um, even transitioning from developer to leader or holding both roles is the ability to speak about that system at different levels, right? To communicate about it, uh, you know, to speak up to people either above you in the organization or to speak down to people below you or in, in, you know, in your employee. And that to me sounds like you have to be able to inhabit the system maybe even at different levels, like conceptually in big picture, small picture. Yes. A, is that the case? And then, okay, so yes. And then B, is that just a... Is that a learned skill? Is that just a natural thing? Like, how do you get to be able to do that? Uh, I love it. Great, great question. So I am very, very much a systems thinker. Um, you know, before I, I uh, the ship sailed on my coding career, you know, three years ago when I stopped writing code day to day, I am always thinking about systems and how systems interact with other systems. Um, now, the way that I employ that systems thinking now is I'm thinking about systems of people and how other people communicate with other people. So just like different systems have API contracts and they have um, different protocols with which they talk to each other, humans are the same way. They have different preferences for how people talk with them, um, the vocabulary that they use, that maps really nicely to the different protocols. And so, and, and I absolutely feel like these are learned skills. Um, in the, oh my goodness, without, you know, revealing my, my age, in the many, many years, like over 15 years that I've been a, a um, postgraduate, I did my graduate work in computer science, and that was a long time ago, and in this, the, the time that I've been a professional software developer and now um, a manager, I have learned these skills. And so I think, um, I, I also really deeply believe that um, anyone can learn anything, and that if given the right environment and the right teachers, that people can absolutely rise to the occasion. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but I think this goes to the, you know, you had started the question around um, how do I employ those skills now? So I'm always, as I think about the systems of people and I think about the different relationships, um, I'm also thinking about how can I communicate in a way to those different audiences? Um, and, and, it, and, and it, the, the analogy in software is then like, what, <laughs> what, what language do I need to speak um, to this system? Or, or how, what vocabulary do I need to use to this human? And um, if I speak too fast, you know, I might need to get rate limited. <laughs> so there's so many analogies of um, how humans interact with some of the systems. And I don't mean to say that in a robotic way. But a, um, we all have preferences, and if you can understand someone's preferences, and that's, I think, a really important part of leadership, is building that rapport and that connection with people so you can understand their preferences. Because if I start sending requests to a system in the wrong language or malformed requests, you know, they're going to be thrown away or I'm, I'm going to get error codes. And so in this world, I need to deeply understand the people just like I need to deeply understand the systems. And so... That goes back to what makes, I think, not only great developers, but also great leaders. And I, I really, I think it's um, important 
to note that the skills that make really senior developers great are often the same skills that make really senior managers great. Um, you can be a leader in an organization if you're a manager or if you're not a manager, if you're an individual contributor. Leadership comes from everywhere, um, but really great leaders, whether it be managers or individual contributors, um, they're really fantastic, as you highlighted, communicators. They know the protocols, the vocabularies, the error codes, the exit statuses. They know all these things, but they then can level up the people around them. They can grow them by being able to teach them new things so they can help the, let's say, next generation, the more junior developers, the more junior managers, the more senior folks teach them about the systems, the mental models that they've developed about how the humans interact or how the systems interact. And as those junior folks learn and grow and they tackle problems, they then can refine and grow their own mental model about how these systems and humans interact with one another. It's interesting. I mean, I agree with you specifically on the, the overlap in skills uh, between a, a great developer and a great leader or, or perhaps manager if that's the same person. Um, we do have this, you know, we do have this idea of the Peter principle, you know, in management where, you know, people tend to get, and I'll just summarize it and not the exact principle, but uh, the way I think of it is people often get promoted to their level of incompetency, right? Like they're very good at this thing. Yes. And so therefore <laughs> a promotion comes and moves them into a role that they're not good at. And that's, unfortunate at the time because they were really good at the other thing, but they need this new position in order to achieve, you know, a salary raise or something like that. So this happens a lot with developers. Like you're, you're a great developer and all of a sudden now you're a manager of developers. And that even though there's overlap in those skills, that doesn't mean you immediately recognize or can apply. Arguably software systems are easier to understand than people are, right? Like we're way more complicated than <laughs> many People ways. are non-deterministic. Yes. Yeah. So do you have tips and tricks or like thoughts on, you know, people, developers who find themselves in the position of manager or leader all of a sudden they feel like they don't have the chops um, to, to thrive in that position? Well, I would say um, I have so many different thoughts. I think um, first, if you're, I do view management as a different job, not a better job, not a worse job, but a different job. And so the challenge is, do, as a developer, do you want to change your job? Um, and if the answer is no, you love your job, you love what you do, and um, you want to continue growing, then hopefully um, you can, whether that be through promotion or through projects, um, assume a role where you're able to teach a larger number of people lead them through like a tech lead position, something along those lines, where like I, I, I think it's very, very important that companies have a track where very senior technologists do not have to become managers. Because again, it is a, it, I do very deeply feel like it is a different job. Um, sometimes when I talk about what I do every day, which um, if you want to know in the one sentence version, it is I read and write English documents. That is what I do all day. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of developers would say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to continue to program. And, um, you know, I, I do read code occasionally, but it, those, those times are fewer and farther between. And so if you want to enter a world where you're spending more time in Google Docs than in Emacs or VI, then, like, potentially, you know, management is for you. Um, but... In order to make that transition, it's so important that your organization can support you with trainings, with mentorship, um, with people who can give you feedback so you can learn and grow because you're, you're doing a totally new and different job. Um, at Slack, I've managed many people who tried out management uh, managing a small team, very senior technologists, technologists who had been programming professionally for 15, 20 years. They wanted to try management. And I do, I do think that it is important if people do want to try it and their intentions are pure, meaning their intention is not because they want more power, um, but their they want to really foster and grow and help others. We tried it out and some of those individuals have been exceptional managers. And some of those folks have realized that this is not their calling. 
And huge hats off to them because it's so hard, it can be so hard once you embark down a different path to realize that it's not for you. And so some of those individuals have transitioned to in, back to individual contributor roles. And I really want to highlight, it's not a demotion, it's a transition back to a different job, to a job where they're fantastic. And so um, the, in large part, some of the folks on my management team um, used to be very senior engineers. Um, and some of them transitioned to IC roles, and others um, have been managers for a decade or more. So I think it's important at a company to also be able to provide the like no penalty, so to speak, for transitioning back to the role if you realize that it's not for you. Just as a point of clarification, when you say IC roles, what are you referring to? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, individual contributor roles. So roles where you're not managing people. So it's very important to to emphasize what you said there when you when you go back to an IC role, that this isn't like a demotion or this isn't a step backwards in your career because management is a different job, but not necessarily a higher calling, so to speak. Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, yes, it is not a um, it is not a better job. It is not a more powerful job. It is not a more prestigious job. It is only Just a different. different job. Yes. I'm sitting here thinking about this and I'm like, I'm that kind of person where I naturally by my talents just gravitate towards manager type roles because I can be in an IC role, an individual contributor, and I will just naturally want to lead. <laughs> it's just something that comes out. It's not something I'm like, I've got it. You know, it's just, it's just my DNA. And if you put me in an individual contributor role, I'll, probably depressed or aloof or not that invested and but you give me an opportunity to influence and change and and determine vision and where we're going to go that's where I thrive and I, I imagine there's a lot of developers out there who are like that as well so how do you how do you keep being a programmer but then also leverage those skills too I completely understand I um to give you a quick story I have a daughter and she's three and we go to music class every Saturday and there's um, at times my daughter's very aware of who's who's following the rules and who's not and the music teacher said it's okay and so I was very self-conscious about this because she likes to correct other people and she likes to like you know stand up there and be um, in charge I say that in a positive way and the teacher <laughs> said there's always a supervisor in every class <laughs> and so, um, and I think good for you to acknowledge that this is where you can be most successful and where you're deriving the most value for yourself and for others. Um, it can be often difficult to know, especially, er I would say early in my career, I didn't know what were the environments and the situations and the ways where I really th was able to thrive. So good for you for, for knowing that. I think, um, so this, this uh, goes back to the, the notion of, even though management and individual contributor, like development programmer roles, um, even though those are different jobs, the higher up that you go in both of them, um, the skills to some degree converge, where instead of you building um, the features, you're leading, communicating, growing, teaching others. And so instead of me communicating vision and strategy through written English words and presentations and PowerPoint decks, um, some of the very, very senior principal engineers and architects in my organization, um, they don't manage people. They don't, they do write um, a lot of documents, English documents about um, how we're gonna build a super complex, um, difficult feature. But then they'll also lead discussions around um, different approaches. So one of the things that we do here at Slack is um, we have what's called the software design workshop. And any engineer in the organization, junior or senior, can write up a technical document about how they're going to approach a feature. And um, then they bring it to the workshop and people opt in, you know, if it's a topic they're interested in. Because again, our engineering organization is quite large. But people can come and then we have a discussion, a spirited and I think fantastic discussion about 
how should we build this? Um, are there any interesting edge cases? And those discussions, I think it's actually, this is really important. Those discussions are led by other engineers. They're not led by managers. Like, I don't actually know that much anymore about what the edge cases are. But let me tell you, some of the very senior engineers in our organization, you bet they do because they've been around for a while and they've probably seen the different patterns and they've seen um, systems fail and what and they have really great models for our systems, mental models. And so they then help facilitate the discussion, which leads to the why communication is so important, facilitate discussion, ask questions, but ensure that the this that the um, the engineers presenting, who might not, who might be senior, or might be junior, that they have a safe space to um, to present their ideas and walk away feeling like they've learned something. So I think that's the. There's still such a such a huge need for very senior developers and programmers in organizations. Because let's face it, sometimes those developers and programmers, especially in senior roles, have more credibility than the managers do. Um, because they're in the trenches on the front line sometimes with the other engineers, and I am no longer in the trenches. And so I, I ask questions, but I'm not there debugging um, if we have some sort of incident. The, that's the, en the engineers are doing that. So Julie, you said in the trenches. Now you're really speaking our language. These are these are common idioms and phrases that Adam and I often use. So as a manager, as a as a leader on on the management side, as you said, you don't have that day to day in the trenches. Not you, you're day to day, but you don't have like the you're not in the debugger. How do you keep your your street cred with your teams? Like how do you stay relevant and not become you know the pointy haired boss that you know is so laughed at in the in the Dilbert comics? So I, I ask a lot of questions, and I think the way, you know, early in my management career, and I see this with a lot of um, kind of more junior managers, they think their job is to have all the answers, and they think that their job, like in the a la Dilbert, is to tell people what to do. And uh, that is, I, I very much believe that is not my job. Um, I ask a lot of questions because I don't have all the answers. Um, ideally, there are very few hard decisions, honestly, that I'm making because I've created an environment with my team where they have the context, they know what we're building, they know why we're building it, they know wh why it's important, and then they decide how they're going to approach actually building things. I try to be, I try very hard not to be prescriptive. My job is not to tell people how to do things, but to again, set the context and let them run free. Because let me tell you, they're gonna, they're gonna come up with much more innovative, interesting, creative solutions to things that I'm going to come up with. So um, you want to, as a manager, I manage, you know, what is the outcome? What do we want to achieve by building this? And how do we build it? You know, that is up to y'all. Run free. Be, um, as y'all, as, as my engineers are in the debugger and I am not. So, again, coming back to your question, all, all I do all day is ask questions. So if someone comes, let's say that someone comes to me um, and they're stuck. And, and this happens... Um, not regularly, but with like a, a, a somewhat normal cadence where maybe we're, we're deadlocked on a decision. We don't know what to do. So when the, when the team comes to me and they've decided like, we, need, we want Julia to weigh in because we don't know what to do. Um, so the first thing that I do in all of those discussions is I start asking a lot of questions because I probably don't have all the context. Um, and most of the time, it, and it's almost like I'm rubber duck debugging the team. They come and I just start asking questions and usually through all the questions that I ask, and I'm not being prescriptive, I'm not telling them what to do, they come to a logical conclusion of what, and they've fixed the problem, they've effectively, the team has decided how to effectively um, fix something themselves. Now, and I think that's, that's fantastic because in, in an ideal world, the team is able to function and make decisions and I manage myself out of a job, meaning they don't need me because they understand what they're doing and um, they understand the business requirements and they, they deeply know um, the purpose of what we're building. Now, 
there's also a, a lot of situations where um, maybe I ask a lot of questions and it's a hard call and I have to make a decision. And part of um, what I do as a, as a now senior leader um, is when I do have to make a decision, I can ask questions rapidly and then be able to make the decision quickly. Because the last thing I would want to do is to block a team from being able to do something. So um, the credibility comes through asking people and getting them to volunteer what they think the solution should be versus coming in and being that boss who doesn't know what's going on, but is telling people to do things that, that those developers are actually in opposed are diametrically opposed to it's it's getting people to talk really right i mean mm-hmm. in a lot of cases you know unless you do that the the silence will will come in and you'll pontificate rather than say hey where should this go here are the problems i'm seeing from this meeting or you know i'm information gathering here i see this problem there here's the collective problem how does this impact you and how can we solve that is that what you mean by that absolutely the, the last thing people want to hear me do is get up on a pedestal and give a speech about how they should solve a problem, how, right. how they, uh, the implementation details of a problem. Um, it is all about exactly asking questions, getting them to talk, getting them at times to, to see things all, like from a different perspective. This episode is brought to you by our friends at GoCD. GoCD is an open source continuous delivery server built by ThoughtWorks. Check them out at GoCD.org or on GitHub at GitHub.com slash GoCD. GoCD provides continuous delivery out of the box with its built-in pipelines, advanced traceability, and value stream visualization. With GoCD, you can easily model, orchestrate, and visualize complex workflows from end to end with no problem. They support Kubernetes and modern infrastructure with elastic on-demand agents and cloud deployments. To learn more about GoCD, visit gocd.org slash changelog. It's free to use. They have professional support and enterprise add-ons available from ThoughtWorks. Once again, gocd.org slash changelog. Scaling up the team at the at the speed of the business, which, as we mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation, has been very rapid. And you're you're from seven ish to up to a seventy person team. I'm sure there's plenty of other teams, um, but your 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 major goal is to keep up keep the infrastructure up with the demand on uh, the platform and the business. So give us some insights into exactly the infrastructure of Slack, some of the technical hurdles y'all have been dealing with, maybe some success stories, maybe some, uh, maybe some bad days. For sure. Um, from a technical perspective, the founders of Slack previously had started Flickr, which was a photo sharing site that they then sold to Yahoo many years ago. So Cal Henderson, who I work with very closely, he's our CTO. Um, during the Flickr days, him and co-founder Sergey, um, who is actually part of the infrastructure organization. I directly managed Sergey for some time, like brilliant technologist. They learned how to scale PHP. So um, Cal even wrote a book um, about scaling PHP and how they Flickr, the first um, you know, consumer web startup of tremendous, tremendous scale, how they went through that period. And so when Cal and Sergey and Stuart Butterfield, our CEO, when they went to start Slack, like they knew how to scale PHP. So um, we have a large PHP um, monolith with many services that we've split out right now. Um, from a, we are, we recently hired, or actually, you know, all the years blend together now, but we have a chief architect, Keith Adams, and he came from Facebook. And so Facebook was also a really large PHP shop, and they then created hack language um, and use HHVM, the hip-hop virtual machine. So we're now transitioning to using hack and HHVM. Um, and fantastic, fantastic 
um, performance improvements there, as well as typing, as well as like many, many of the affordances of modern languages. Um, we tend to, at Slack, you know, use boring technology. And um, part of the reason for that, and I, I say boring with so much love, is because we have to know how to operate the technologies that we use at incredible, incredible scale. And so we don't want to be on the bleeding edge because we have to have incredibly high uptime because we have so many companies, you know, from the NASA's of the world to Capital One to IBM to eBay, all of these companies run the backbone of their business on Slack and we can never, ever go down. And so from in scaling infrastructure, we build a lot of the services that connect to the monolith. And so some of those services are written in Java, some of them um, are written in Go. And so I now manage a fantastic team of machine learning and search engineers. We have that office based out of New York. And so they're also experimenting with some Java and Go services that connect to the monolith. And we're slowly, we're not, we do not have a microservices model, but we are split, when it makes sense, we split things off the monolith and potentially um, turn them into external services. So my, one of the things that we've done in um, my organization is, you know, in, the, in the early days of having services that we've either split off um, or that were always separate, um, we, would, we didn't deeply understand the SLAs around those services. Um, and so as we've grown, one of the ways in which we've matured is understanding and having um, performance targets and also, and again, SLAs for all the services that we're building. And these are not external SLAs, these are SLAs for ourselves because infrastructure is a horizontal organization, meaning um, we build, of course, common infrastructure that's used by 300, 300, 350 engineers that are in product engineer, engineering, like building on top of what we've built. Reminds me of a conversation we had a long time ago now. Man, time flies. 2014, we had Sarah Goldman, uh, who worked at Facebook at the time. I believe she still does, but perhaps not. Come on the show, talk all about the PHP language spec, making PHP awesome, the work they were doing with HHVM and Hack. And there's been a whole bunch of engineering efforts by many companies now. Uh, happy to hear Slack contributing and using PHP and helping make it uh, an awesome language of today. So we use Slack every day, almost all day, every day. And you mentioned like it always it always has to be <laughs> up. And like I, I can't think of a time. I think there was one time when Slack was down. I'm just trying to think if you had any real bad days now. Uh, another one of our um, often used services, Twitter, and you know they they historically have had many bad days, and we we even lovingly think of the fail whale of of years oh, past. Oh yes, um, they actually Twitter had some downtime maybe last week, and I noticed the fail whale's gone. It's like the, a weird octocat looking thing. Yeah, it is. Instead, I was like, that's, that's right. not. Yeah, there's not. That's not endearing. Give us the fail whale. But Slack really hasn't had. I mean, Adam, can you think of a time where it's just like, well, Slack's down. I guess we'll email each other. No, no, I I don't. The only thing I would really ever notice, and this isn't a dig, is just maybe slower service, not down service, which mm -hmm. could be, but isn't as bad. So service degradation. Yeah. You know, yes. or like starting up the app, you know, it takes 10 seconds versus, you know, instant or closer to instant, you know, it, it, those kinds of things. Or you know, slow notifications, you know, when you rely mm -hmm. on notifications, iOS notifications, and yep. you've already had the conversation. And then finally on your iOS device, you get a notification or two of the conversation you've already had. Those kinds of things. I'm sure that they're not quite down, but they're like, it's sort of, you know, not relevant anymore. So how do you deal with the, you know, non-relevant, you know, distributed notifications that should have been closer to real time that are now just not important anymore? See, I think you're highlighting on a really interesting question, which I, I see the parallels in. Sometimes no internet is better than slow internet, where you want a service to be really quick. You want to ensure that your notifications show up instantaneously. Imagine if you get a DM from your boss, you want to know. Um, you want to be able to respond if that's your relationship with your boss. Um, and so... We think about this a lot, and we think about it especially 
with respect to we've grown so fast and now that over half the messages in Slack are sent outside of the US, um, we have to have an infrastructure that allows Slack to boot instantly everywhere around the world, meaning Houston, Omaha, since Adam, Jared, I know you're out there, but also in Japan and Asia Pacific. And so we run Slack on in the cloud and we've been cloud from day one. And we've had, we've, as part of the infrastructure organization, we've had to build a lot of tooling to understand what our performance is around the world. And also, you know, you were talking about notifications and especially on mobile, you know, we, ha we use the infrastructure, um, I believe it's APNS, which is the infrastructure provided by Apple to send notifications on iOS. There's also an analogous system on Android. And so it's one of the very, one of the most difficult things is um, providing a service that is used 24 hours a day, seven days a week around the globe on top of um, that people need to do their jobs that has to almost be more reliable than the internet backbone. And so what I mean by that is um, there are parts of the world where the internet backbone is less reliable, especially um, in Asia Pacific. Let's say that you get a DM and it doesn't come in fast enough. It seems delayed, like Slack seems slow. You don't care that like there's DNS issues that are happening in your part of the world. You need Slack to be fast and that's what you expect. And so one of the, the awesome challenges here is figuring out how to provide that level of service um, when we don't control the, nest, the, um, the racked machines that are, we don't have our own data centers. So how do we do that when we don't have that low, low, low level of control? And the way that we do it and the way that we're figuring it out because you know we're, again, like the scale is just tremendous is by building software. And I mean, that's, that makes me incredibly excited. So like we're, we're figuring out how to work with different vendors to build really resilient fault tolerant software that can provide you that level of experience when fundamentally the underlying infrastructure, the cloud providers that we run on, and then the internet backbone lines that they run on um, do not provide the level of uptime that we need. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting perspective to think about that too, because you know, I'll also say this, we're not paying you, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> so we're, you know, obviously not complaining. I said, are you, do you mean that in terms of we're on the free version of Slack? Right, right, exactly. So like we, you know, I think of this as an interesting problem because you have such a unique type of software where you have a lot of people using it for free and a lot of people, you know, in your own terms, we're not like ripping you off. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, it's oh, the of way course. things work. <laughs> But the point is, is like if we were, that'd be a really bad uh, yeah. confession right there. By the way, we're not paying you. <laughs> Surprise. I'm not beating on down your door and demanding it from you. But, you know, we talk about uptime or downtime or reliability. You know, I've never really seen Slack down, but I've seen it be slow or I've seen it be, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, delayed. And you're right. I don't think like, hey, DNS isn't working properly here in Houston, Texas. I just think Slack is not working right. You know, I blame you, not the yeah. DNS, you know, or the other problems in the internet backbone. Or when S3 went down. Or, or yeah, or S3 went down or something changed to make things not work right. So we, we definitely have had, you know, we, so we run our business on Slack. Like we are, we're, we're Slack on Slack all day. And when Slack is, when we do have um, service interruptions, when things are slow, you know, it really heavily impacts our ability to do work. And when you build software, you know, we, we do everything we can to ensure we have um, unit testing and load testing and we have linting and we have tooling. But I mean, we're all engineers here. We make mistakes. Like we all wish that we could write perfect code and like never deploy bugs, but like, of course we do. And so the, the, like the, the challenge becomes, so like, so we absolutely have had situations where, you know, Slack has gone down for, for periods of time. And so what we've done is ensure that we, when things happen, because they, they do, 
that we're able to recover and detect those problems instantaneously. And so in an ideal world, we release, um, we accidentally break something or um, S3 goes down or a huge storm in Northern Virginia impacts US East, the Amazon um, facility out there. And, and we're able to detect that and reroute the traffic or um, revert the bug and do that without you ever noticing. And that's the world that we're moving towards is uh, being able to detect and recover really, really, really rapidly um, so that you all will never know that anything happened. And you're doing that through relationships. Talk, you, you mentioned talking to vendors. and um, So we, we talk with our vendors very, very regularly. Um, we also build software that can handle network flakiness um, to, in case something does happen with the underlying network. Um, and that's, I feel like that's such a fascinating engineering challenge because it's like trying to understand ways in which something will fail. Like so, uh, when, you, when you build software, there's often obvious edge cases and then there's things that happen where you're like, I never could have imagined that that ever would have happened. And now right. we have another like, <laughs> cla like if else clause <laughs> so of how to right. handle that. I think a lot about it. And again, like this is, as someone who runs an infrastructure organization, I think a lot about um, these types of the challenges at scale um, that involve only vendors, that involve um, us building and baking in resiliency into our software. Um, another fascinating, um, fascinating thing, at least to me, about Slack is you know, we open, when you leave, most people have Slack open for 10 hours a day on the desktop. And they may not, like, they're probably not sending messages for 10 hours a day, but they have it, like, passively open. And we open a WebSocket connection, and we're sending increment, incremental, like, diffs, if you will, um, across that web WebSocket. Now, so the the reason that at times, and, and we, we've worked, we're, like, very heavily working on this, the reason that that startup time might be low is because... We need to send you a whole lot of data across the WebSocket. Now, remember, WebSockets are a bi-directional communication. So we're sending, like, how many um, is Jared in new channels? Has Adam gotten some new DMs? Um, has someone mentioned Jared or Adam? All We're sending all of this information, the state of the world, since you last connected across the WebSocket. Um, and then once you're connected, you know, we're able to send you um, – smaller bits of information about things that have changed. Now, one of the things that happens that's, that's particularly precarious is if, if a lot, if we, if we see millions of users or tens of millions get um, knocked offline, like let's say there's a storm, um, let's say we deploy a bug, let's say that you know something, the internet backbone in Singapore um, has a blip, and suddenly all those connect those users are knocked offline. Um, they all immediately, you know, hit refresh or they wait, and suddenly we've got millions, tens of millions of users trying to reconnect. And those are the things that are really difficult. And so building systems that can handle those what we call reconnection storms, that's really, really interesting and has been really hard because you really have to build infrastructure that can handle so much greater than your current load. But that's not just sending the data, it's querying for the data, it is packaging it, getting it to clients, ensuring the clients can parse it efficiently, all of these things. And I think that's a that's such an exciting challenge. I'm sure we can go much, much deeper on these challenges. And I think these are these are just probably never ending and probably not even the most maybe fun for you to talk about, but always fun to reveal. Maybe before we want to ask you like one or two questions about your upcoming talk here at Velocity, but I think maybe it, share what you can. Uh just to give listeners kind of a scale of like how many users do you, is there any public information around like, you know, paid or unpaid users so you can kind of help the audience listen or understand, you know, what the scale you're actually operating at when it comes to a, you know, concurrent user base or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have over 9 million weekly active users and over 6 million daily active users. Um, there's over 2 million paid users. Um, and, I, what, what I think is super cool, so of those paid users, of the 2 million paid, um, 
you know, 43% of Fortune 100 companies use Slack. So um, it's, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the companies that you think about, um, credit cards, Capital One, you know, they're, they're running their business on Slack. Super cool. Ticketmaster, if you're buying tickets um, on Slack, but also a lot of like fascinating and exciting like NASA, I, I, had, I had talked about them before, um, doing really, really cool stuff on top of Slack. And of course, there's a lot of technology companies, the PayPals, um, the LinkedIn's, um, Spotify, Pinterest, they're all running their businesses on Slack. Um, so that's, that's the, and, and I think what is, not only do we have, you know, rapidly growing numbers of users, but I think the the demands on the service in terms of we can never go down are really high. You know, if you think about consumer internet businesses, um, for example, Twitter, we had talked about them earlier, um, Facebook, when those services go down, of course, like that really sucks. And um, there's clearly a loss for those companies in ad revenue. You know, when Slack goes down, um, Capital One, the people at Capital One can't do their work. And that's, ter that's, that's terrible. Um, if Ticketmaster goes down, you know, then potentially, you know, they can't process orders. And so, you know, the reliability um, and scalability constraints are real. And, I, and I, I think that's really exciting because I think it means that we've built an incredible product that people love and that people rely on every day to do their job. And ideally, we're in the background, like, we just work. So... I th the other, I think, segueing to you had asked like a few other numbers. When I first started using Slack, before I ever thought about working at the company, um, I had I had started a company, and I was I installed all the engineering integrations on top of Slack. So I did you know GitHub continuous integration, PagerDuty. We also use Zendesk for um, our customer support tickets, and so we have. Um, a really, really active and vibrant developer community that builds on top of the APIs. And so we've got something like a thousand apps in our app directory. And the app directory was actually the first big launch that I was part of at Slack, which was super cool because you had to go like search for apps. And that's how I, like in my early Slack days, how I found apps, I would go searching, you know, Google search. And now you can search in the app directory. Um, and there's something like a hundred, this is, this is, I think just so cool. Cause I built apps before I even joined the company. Like I built integrations so I could send data, pipe data from, um, our systems into Slack so that I wouldn't like, if something was going wrong, I hooked up our error servers to Slack so that I could see the channel light up versus like waiting for the email or waiting for the page. Cause I was like in Slack all the time. There's something like 155,000 of these weekly active developers building on Slack. So that's like, a, that's a lot of people building on Slack. And I think that's so cool because they're building things that like we never could have imagined in, in, you know, in, in a wonderful way. I think uh, what's interesting is that you've got, I think you said 2 million ish paying users, but roughly 9 million on a week in a week. Right. Yeah. Is that, to me, that's like just crazy because of what you're doing for your uptime and that uh, a large majority of your users aren't paying you. You're feeling guilty, aren't you, Adam? Uh, well, I'm just feeling like, you know, it's just the world we live in, but it's just <laughs> like, you know, you kind of understand why services, you know, charge a higher premium for what they do because it takes a lot to run them. But you've got a large majority, you know, using a service for free, but they get this, you know, maybe not the same, but a very similar service. We probably get a very similar service that – you know, some one of these companies that uses you that pays you. Yeah, I mean, I think they've done a good job set, setting setting forth a a what seems to be a solid business model with free versus paid, and it seems like everybody's happy that way, at least so far, right, Julia? So what I love is that all the changes that we make to ensure that the service is better for big customers, every single small customer and free team benefits too. And so um, that's, I think that's really exciting because not only can, you know, the people who use Slack for work hopefully have a better experience, but then in the communities that you run, you're also be able to benefit from all of those things as well. And so um, I think another, like, active user numbers also, you know, they, they vary. And it, it, as an enterprise software company, you know, we see 
there's there's periods of time when user group you, like Mondays are really big days for us, for example, because everybody comes back online because they spent the weekend, you know, hopefully chilling out. And so we we those numbers fluctuate based on like the the um, the calendar year. The I think what's what's super interesting for from my perspective was, you know, in the early days of Slack, usage would dip over the holidays because people weren't working. Like they'd take a week off or you know two weeks off for winter holidays and New Year's. But as we've grown, we see that less because there are more companies on using Slack that um, don't have that dip in the holidays. So the companies that don't are the ones like credit card processors, for example, or anyone in e-commerce. So as we start to see more and more folks the the quote unquote like nice break we used to get off the holidays like that doesn't exist anymore it's been no. it's been really really cool to watch um, where we have to like we used to be able to say like you know only one person is triaging bugs but it's not it's that's not the case anymore so um, mm-hmm. so that's been that's been like wonderful you know the the challenges of success and the challenges of growth. Well, Joel, I want to plug your talk here at Velocity here in a bit. We work closely with O'Reilly, especially around Velocity, Fluent, and OzCon conferences they, they put on. And we're always happy to talk with speakers like yourself speaking at this conference. So you're giving a talk called Scaling Yourself During Hypergrowth. And I think we're actually going to title this podcast Scale All the Things or Scaling All the Things, one of the two. Um, you know, I'm excited about this, this talk. We, we have some team members going to be there. Listeners, if you're checking this out and you're going to go to that conference you'd like to, we can give you 20% off either a gold, silver, or bronze pass. Use the code changelog. Check the show notes for a link. And we'll also include a link to Julia's talk there as well. Maybe you can catch it. If not, maybe it'll be on YouTube. Who knows? But uh, anything you want to share with us in closing to, to some of the things either in your talk or things we haven't covered that you want to say as we as we tail out. Thank you both so much for having me. If any of these challenges um, of scale, of growth, um, resonate with any of you listeners out there and you're interested in learning more and working on some of these things, mm. you, know, you can find me um, easily on Twitter. I really, I, I would love Love for, the Twitter handle, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank Julia. you. Know what? You know, I, <laughs> I, a last final story. When I was 18 years old and I went to college, I had to choose my email address, and it had to be more than five characters. And so J U L I A, how I spell my name, is five characters. It wouldn't work. So I immediate. So you know, as an 18 year old, I had to come up with this handle. And you know what? Many decades later, it's still around. <laughs> so nice. any 18 year olds out there, you're <laughs> the decisions live with you. So um, it's a big thank, decision. So, so you know, fa- and now of course you can have five character or less. You know, the, the world is a different place. If only. Um, so find me on Twitter. I, the talk. Come to the talk. Velocity is such a great conference. Huge shout out to the O'Reilly folks who do an incredible, incredible job. I feel so honored to be able to talk about these things, both, I believe, in a keynote and a session, um, so we can dig deep there, and then it should, I think, be on YouTube later, so um, come find me. I'd love to talk more, and um, I hope you are having a wonderful, delightful experience on all of your slacks. There you go. All your slacks. I'm on many slacks. Julia, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, appreciate you coming on the call. Thank you both so much. All right, thank you for tuning in today. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, rate us on Apple Podcasts, go on Overcast and favorite it. And of course, thank you to our sponsors, Airbreak, Digital Ocean, and Go CD. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Check them out. Support this show. The Changelog is hosted by myself, Adam Stokoviak, and Jared Santo. Editing is done by Tim Smith. Music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at Changelog.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.